No mates. There he is, sitting at the bar, staring at the optics, thinking to himself, where have all my buddies gone? The answer is usually quite simple. They hate your guts. It usually takes years of experience and hard work to acquire no mate status. This usually takes the form of years and years of slovenly lying, extraordinary bragging, numerous claims which the general public know to be impossible, and developing strong body odours. The end began uh, in the early 80s. It was, uh, I used to go to Probe Records quite a lot in Liverpool. You used to see these sort of uh, anarchist punk magazines, you know. I thought there was nothing really for uh, people in Liverpool, you know, which was aimed at um, skitting everything that moved. What made you start the end? We wanted to start it because uh, there was no, like, magazine in, in Liverpool which catered for the type of people that we were, you know, wanting to cater for, like, you know, the, the average young Liverpoolian. And yeah, that. but there were, there were fanzines and magazines. Yeah, it was more for, like, students, you know, type sort of arty fancy yeah, types, whatever you call them. What about, what about, do you sell the magazine, then? Yeah, we sell them in all the record shops in Liverpool. And plus, at the uh, Liverpool and Everton matches. And we get to sell loads by mail as well, up okay. 200 by mail. Yeah. How many did you sell all together then? Three and a half thousand. Copy the end, lads. No thanks, mate. Buy it, minge bags. My initial uh, involvement was as a glorified paper seller, issue one, which was sold at a dead Kennedy's concert. It's with an American rock and roll band, uh, sorry, punk band, in case anyone's uh, interested. And basically, we couldn't get anyone to sell it, so Peter asked me. Trying to sell the first few editions at the end was, you know, was very difficult. It, um, I realised I needed some tough-looking lads who used to go to football matches to help me out. Um, so basically, I re recruited people like uh, Michael Potter, who uh, was well known in various circles. So he basically bullied people into buying the magazine. I remember vividly how it came into my clutches. Mick Potter had a very interesting sales technique. I was in the, the Sandon, the big back room in the old Sandon by Liverpool's ground. And uh, this menacing figure with a telescopic chin who I'd seen around town just came and leaned over and went, by the end, lad. So uh, I bought the end. My brother Mick and his mate, Peter, doing a magazine. And uh, he kind of pointed at me one time in a pub and said, you can draw, can't you? And uh, I went, well, a bit. So he got fed up with using photos and started using my scribbles. We, I mean, the early editions, we, had, I mean, we deliberately went for the lowest common denominator. We went for people who went to football matches, mainly for two away matches, and that was the idea of the magazine. Uh, and obviously, the, the fair, if you read some of the early editions now, you know, I cringe reading some of them because of, uh, because of some of the things in there. But we were directing our attentions at, at the hooligan element at football matches. And unashamedly so, you know, that's what we set out to do. And that's what we did. But people were a bit bemused in Liverpool. Uh, they didn't believe that uh, it was written by Liverpool people, I think. It was just something so unusual. It was brilliant. I mean, people just, just perfect timing. I mean, people just kept saying that's what, that's what we needed at the match, because the, uh, the old subculture of the match wasn't getting represented. It was, you see it in the mass media, just like thugs. Yeah, well, obviously we've seen a different side to it, you know what I mean? As I, as I say, the drink and the social side of it, and everything that was tied in, the kind of music that were people in, people were into, it was a big. That was as much part of the scene as going to the match. So yeah, the reaction was fantastic. It just took off. The content at the end never changed either, which was good, because you had your poems, you had your ins and our outs charts, which I think they invented. You had your letters page, which was really good. It had all the key elements of a great magazine. It had humour, it had reader interaction, it had interviews. It was easy to read and had its own style. And that's what made it a great mag, as well as the attitude and the humour. We had uh, articles on uh, coach drivers, community bouncers, no mates, don't let ons, Billy Bull, Joe Wag. There was a whole series of things which, you know, it, they've become part of uh, the language now. TikTok. Albert Doc, talk tick makes me sick. We didn't ask people to write poetry. People just started sending poems in, you know, and we were uh, amazed at the number of poems from uh, Her Majesty's institutions, you know. Actually, a lot of the poems were written by people who, a lot of people we knew who'd never ever written before in their lives, and we'd actually get people would walk up to me in the pub and 
stick a poem in my pocket and say, make it as a poem, but don't say I wrote it. Oh, God, the dreadful poems page that I campaigned for years to drop because it was awful. Winston Jusen. Uh, the best po best person who broke in was a bloke called Addo, who we later became good friends with in Bournemouth because his poems were completely bizarre and all the rest were, you know, isn't it terrible what it's all. Lentil soup with chunks of ham. No one makes it like me, ma'am. Loads of hot pepper on a freezing cold day. She's just made some more. Hip, hip, hooray. Basically, we used them to fill up pages. We may as well admit it now. We'd run out of ideas. And we used poems and letters to fill four or five pages, you know. Inns, two twos, polar neck wellies, Barry from Alvida's aim pet, fireman, Harry Flashman, being able to smile, world at war, the clash. The ins and outs charts were a thing of wonder and beauty to a young Leeds fan like myself. Me, Peter and Phil, we'd have so many. We just used to be taking pen out with us, we'd go out to the match or a night out and uh, we'd always be scribbling them down. Every paper, as I remember, a lot, a lot of tabloids like The Sun and The Mirror like copied the ins and outs and loads of magazines since and different guises, but uh, that's the one great sign for the end, I suppose, the ins and outs comes. Outs. Tithead who say he's a good robber, saying let's do the business, trying to get fit, pretending pets are clever, decent human beings, Playing for Liverpool, estimating the size of a match. Joe Wag and uh, Dosser and people like that and Billy Bull, they were all based upon, uh, they were a mishmash really, of uh, characters that we knew, which made them funny, I think, because, you know, people could realise and they could identify with certain characters that they knew, you know, because there's, there's nothing as funny as real life. I can't think of any many magazines where I can quote lines, but whether it's girls with Jimmy Case knees, Fashion crazy Yorkshiremen, whatever. Hot dog sellers. You know, I can remember the articles very clearly. Hot dog man. As a youngster in school, most of my pals wanted to be firemen, doctors, footballers or pop stars. But it was always my ambition to be a hot dog salesman. Anyone turning in for duty with clean fingernails is immediately cautioned. And if the offender is a regular one, he may even be made to eat one of his own hot dogs.